home alone and you hear a knock, don't answer the door. That was my grandmother's one rule when she left me the family house. I thought it was just the rantings of an old woman. I didn't know how real the rule was until the other night. The house I inherited was deep in the forest, far from bustling city noises. Silence was the unspoken language here, except sometimes you would hear the owls. But the other night when I was sitting in the living room reading a book, that's when I heard it. There was a single knock at the front door. And then I remembered my grandmother's warning. If you're home alone and you hear one knock, don't answer the door. I looked over at my grandfather clock in the corner. It was midnight. I told myself that the knock was just a figment of my imagination. It was just the house settling or a fallen branch against the door. But then it came again, a single solitary knock. But this time it sounded closer. I was panicking. I just stood there staring at the door. The third knock was so loud that it made the door rattle. There was no more denying it. Something was at the door. If you're home alone and you hear a knock at the door, don't answer it. The last thing I told you is I heard that knock. I held my breath, hoping that if there was something there, it would just leave. Minutes started to tick by, and then I heard it. It was so faint that part of me thought it wasn't even real. And I know you guys are dying to know what it said. Let me in. I was terrified, and that's when I remembered the attic. If I could make it up to the attic, there was a lock inside. As I ran up the stairs, I could hear the whispers growing louder. Once I got into the attic, I bolted the door shut. After a while, the whispering stopped. I didn't dare move. I didn't dare breathe. Minutes turned into hours, and soon the darkness of light started to turn into the morning glaze. I'm pretty sure Grandma's rule kept me alive, and now I fully understood it. The old house was not just a place of solitude. It was also home to something old, something terrifying. Whatever was on the other side was not of this world. So just remember Grandmother's rule. My friend won't let anyone in her house after 9.30, and I just found out why. They're the happiest couple that I've ever met. Like, if you didn't believe in love, this couple would make you believe in it. But one evening, it all came crashing down. I arrived at Jay-Z's house at 5 p.m. sharp. She is obsessed with time. Always wondering why someone's a minute late or a minute early, as if she's a detective and you're in her interrogation room. But before I get into what happened, let me tell you a little bit about Jay-Z. She's got pitch black hair, a nose ring, wears dark clothing. She's the type of girl that has pumpkins sitting out in the beginning of September. And she's super welcoming. Actually, the rug on her front door reads, leave now. So tonight I was going by her house because me and her had planned a movie night. But we had to start the movie night at 5 because she never lets anyone in her house after 9.30. As soon as I walked into her house, I immediately smelled cinnamon cookies. I was hoping they were for me, well, for us. But JC just brought in a big bowl of popcorn and some drinks. Which was fine. I certainly wasn't going to complain and lose her trust for the next two decades. Then the movie ended. We thought Halloween 2 was okay. While JC went upstairs to find another movie, I decided to give myself a tour of the house. And here's when things started to go wrong. I was just glad she was willing to watch another movie and that she was letting her friends back into her life. She hadn't really been social since her and Tyler broke up. No one knows what happened between them, just that they were together one day and then the next day they weren't. After the breakup, no one heard from Tyler again. Then we started the second movie, Saw 4. She fell asleep during the movie, and the next time I checked my phone, it was 9.15. I thought, I better get going soon, even though she probably wasn't going to wake up in the next 15 minutes. I headed over to the kitchen to grab a glass of water before leaving, and then I saw those cinnamon cookies on the counter, and I was like, she's not going to miss one, right? After finishing the cookie, I turned on the water on the sink to wash my hands, but I was trying to be like really quiet because I didn't want to wake her up. The water didn't wake her up, but my scream did. My friend won't let anyone in her house after 9.30 part 2. So the last thing I told you is JC awoke to my scream. I saw the face of a man outside of the kitchen window. She ran to the kitchen and I told her to call the cops. What did he look like? She asked me. But I didn't know. He was definitely a man. I think he was white. She burst out in laughter and said, that's enough scary movies for tonight. But I was refusing to leave because I had just seen a man. I knew I saw a man out the window. Then I saw the same man through the living room window. Except JC saw it too. She ran to the front door and I thought she was making sure it was locked, but no. She was making sure I I didn't look through the peephole. I ran up to her and yelled, move, we need to be able to identify this guy for the police. Confusion hit me. Why won't you move? She broke down and started crying. At this point, I could tell that she had basically given up. She was hiding something. She said, you know that old woman that me and Tyler visited? Now, let me just preface this. Tyler and JC were about 
as open-minded as people come. They tried basically every religion, and they were meeting up with this woman because she claimed to have some certain abilities. While she was telling me this, the man was still banging against the door. But as open-minded as they were, she told me that when she met up with the old woman, they couldn't help but laugh at her claiming to be one of the last real witches in the world. I tried to look around Jackie to see what was going on outside, and that's when I saw it. This was the stuff of nightmares. The man was on all fours and had pitch black eyes. And when he opened his mouth, he had cat-like teeth. She got up and ran to the kitchen and grabbed the tray of cinnamon cookies. I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you not freaking out? Then she walked outside and started giving this half man, half creature these cinnamon cookies. And that's when I realized Tyler always did love cookies. Have you heard of the Can You Hide game? We've all heard of Bloody Mary, Charlie Charlie, and those games are scary, but they're nothing compared to the Can You Hide game. It's not something you can find on the App Store or the Google Play Store. There's nothing about the game on any public websites except this cautionary post. It doesn't matter if you're a good or a bad person, it chooses its targets randomly. No matter how hard you try, you can't avoid the game. Nobody can. First, you're gonna hear a ding on your phone and then a window might pop up. All it will say is, can you hide? Yes or no? Make sure you pick no. When it first appeared on my phone screen, I was shocked. I thought it was like some sort of virus and there's no option to close the window. There's only yes and no. I didn't want to infect my phone, so I decided to do some research first. I tried to Google it, but I couldn't find anything about the yes, no game. The only thing I could find is one thread that pointed me toward a Discord server. There was an entire category for this new game that started appearing on people's phones. Clicking yes apparently starts a hide and seek game with the unknown. When I read that, I was like, I don't know what this means, so I kept reading. The first person on the thread said, can anybody help me? Nobody seems to know anything about this game. My friend played it nonstop for a week and then he went missing. That was two weeks ago. There are daily search parties, but I don't think they're gonna find him. He told me it wasn't a game. He said he saw a face outside of his window. Some people said you have to select no. Other people said it destroyed their life. Some people said the only way is to not choose anything. Just leave it on your phone forever. Someone said, what if I just turn off my phone? The last comment on the thread, it's your funeral. The more I was reading, the more anxious I felt and I still didn't know what to choose. I'm out of time, so go to part two. Don't play the yes, no game. I finished reading the Reddit thread and I told myself I was just being a big baby. Just choose yes or no. It's not that hard. I had finally decided what I was going to do. I turned my phone off and I took it a step further. I reset my phone to the factory settings. But when the weekend was over and I met up with my friends, I found out my friend Corey had been playing the Can You Hide game. I was about to tell him that he was supposed to choose no when he threw down his phone. He was already open to the game window. Apparently, he'd been playing it all week. On the phone screen, there was a map with a little green marker indicating his location. Then, there was a little red marker that was slowly getting closer to us. Every day, once a day, from 2 to 4 in the afternoon, Corey had to hide. It tracks your location, so you have to keep moving. I checked my watch. It was 10 minutes to four, but Corey wasn't hiding. He was in the park with me. And the red marker also just arrived at the park. It had found Corey and my gut told me something very bad was about to happen. Then Corey jumped up and screamed. That's a wrap, four o'clock again, I bested the game. But when he checked the map, it was only a hundred feet away from him. I checked his phone. It read, you avoided the creaker by 121 yards. Then I heard something that terrified me. There was a creak. I looked up from the table and looked around. Corey didn't even seem to notice the sound. I checked Corey's phone again, this time looking for the red dot on the map. It was in the forest about 100 feet away from us to the left. So I looked over there. Peering around the bark of the tree was one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my entire life. There was some thing looking directly at us. It was not human. It was as short as a toddler, and its head, if it had a head, was wearing this peach-colored rubber mask. Almost the tone of human flesh, but not quite. But worst of all, it was smiling at me. Never play the yes, no game, part three. The last thing I told you is the creaker was looking right at me. I told Corey, it looks like someone is actually seeking you. I pointed at the tree. I don't think you should play that game anymore. He looked over and didn't see anything and told me that my phasmophobia was really killing his mood. 
And I mean, I do have a proclivity for trembling at everyday sights and sounds. In my mind, there's always been a ghost or ghoul around the corner. Ever since my parents passed, I had been that way. But I knew I had saw that thing behind the tree. But since I have phasmophobia, it makes it very difficult for people to believe me when I think I see or hear something. My friends told me to go home and just get some rest. At this point, I was starting to think, maybe I am going crazy. Maybe I'm on the verge of a psychotic break. The next day, around half six in the evening, on my drive home from work, Tanya called me. She was one of my friends that was in the park the day before. I said, I'm driving, what's up? And then I realized she was bawling on the other end of the phone. It's in the house, she whispered. The game started playing, it's earlier than usual. I said, slow down, what's happening? She said the game started at six, and I think you were right. I think someone's actually seeking us. We saw a horrible face in the window. There were creaking sounds in the house. We were hiding in the attic. I asked her if she had called the police, and she said they were on their way. It would be about 15 minutes. Then Corey told her they needed to be quiet. And then on the other side of the phone, I heard a creak. Never play the yes no game, part four. The last thing I told you was Corey and Tanya were hiding in the attic and we all heard a creak. It sounded so close that I turned around to make sure that nightmarish demon wasn't in my car. At that point, I decided not to go home and to go check on them. I was only eight minutes away from Corey's house, closer than the police, but not by much. I was still on the phone with them and I heard Tanya whisper, how did it even get in here? I didn't see the door open. Then Corey goes, he's not an id, he's just a child and he needs to leave our- He didn't get to finish his sentence because Tanya interrupted him screaming, What is that? But Corey started to beg. The screams of my two friends were deafening. I was so fixated on reaching the house that I didn't hang up the call. It was only as I pulled into Corey's driveway that I realized I had been listening to the sounds of squelching, snapping, and the most haunting of all, creaking. I barged in the front door and ran all the way up to the attic. I expected to find some sickening scene. The space was empty and Corey and Tanya were gone. The police questioned me when they arrived, but my alibi was airtight. The call to the police was made before I had even left my office and traffic camera footage put me up too far from the scene of the crime during the call. The final verdict, missing persons. The devil offered me a deal. You always hear about the devil making deals in Hollywood. And I live in Hollywood, but I never thought he would try to make a deal with me. Now this isn't the craziest thing I've been through, but it's probably a close second. Now I am of Christian faith and I have a great relationship with God. But if anything, I feel like that makes you more susceptible to this kind of thing. I mean, you never hear about like, an atheist getting possessed. I don't know, just a thought. Anyways, it was just a normal day and I blinked. But when I opened my eyes, I wasn't where I was before. I was now sitting at a hardwood desk. I remember all of this in very clear detail, except for his face. In front of me on the desk was a stack of paper and a pen. When I looked at him, I knew he was the devil. He didn't say he was, I just knew. His eyes were gold like the ember of flame. I don't think I'll ever forget those eyes. They made me think of a Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland. And then he spoke. He said, I have an offer for you. Someone you know has sold their soul. You can give me your soul to save theirs, but you will have nothing you want in life and I will own your soul forever. No love, no success, nothing that you've ever wanted. Or you can keep your soul and have everything you've ever wanted in life but their soul will remain as mine. My biggest question, who? But the devil is tricky and he just said, someone you know. That could mean a friend, an acquaintance, a family member. Now the obvious answer is selling your soul is wrong. So why did it feel like that's what he wanted me to choose? His offer raised a lot of questions. Who would you give up your life and also your eternal life for. I would save my family, I would save my friends, but shouldn't the answer be I would save anyone? All of our souls should have equal value to God, but selling your soul is wrong. And I don't know what answer is right. So I asked for some time to decide, and then I blinked. The devil offered me a deal. The last thing I told you is I asked the devil for some more time to think it over. And then I blinked and when I opened my eyes, I was exactly where I was before. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before, so I didn't really know what to think at that point. I knew I had to figure out my answer because I didn't know when he would come back. Contemplating this took up a lot of my time and I asked close friends and family members what they would do, metaphorically. Because if you just come out and say, oh, I talked to the devil, people are gonna think 
any of your Looney Tunes, like some of you probably think I am. Anyways, that wasn't the last time I spoke to him. About three months later, I blinked, and the same thing happened. Except this time, I was walking down the street, and a man was walking towards me. It was a bit disoriented, and then the man bumped into me and looked me in the eyes. That's when I saw those same golden flamed eyes, and I knew. The devil was back, and he was ready for my answer. I had had a few months to figure out what I was going to choose, but three months wasn't enough time for me to make that decision. I don't know if an entire lifetime would be enough time to decide. Then it dawned on me. It's not right to make a deal with the devil. It was presented to me that there were only two choices. Sell your soul to save someone else and have nothing you ever want in life. Keep your soul, have everything in life you've ever wanted. But I decided not to decide. He hasn't been back to visit me since, but I don't know if that means he never will. What would you choose? I have thalassophobia. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a deep-seated fear of the sea, and also the fear of what lurks beneath the surface. I've had this fear for as long as I can remember, but one night my friends talked me into going out to sea. And I probably should have just stayed home. My friends are super adventurous and daring. They absolutely love the ocean. One summer night, they decided they wanted to go on a sailing trip. I told them I didn't want to go, but they said, come on, it'll be fun. Eventually, they convinced me. Before I knew it, I was on a sailboat surrounded by nothing but moonlit ocean. At first, me and my friends were having a lot of fun. And then we started getting further and further from the shore and the water turned black. We started to feel sick, like something was just not right. Then the singing started. It echoed over the water. And then my friends stopped laughing. It was like our joy had just been sucked right out of the air. Something about the song was not right. It almost felt hypnotic. But the song seemed to have more effect on my friend Max than anyone else. We all started talking about what it was, but Max separated himself from the group. And this was very unlike Max because he was always the life of the party. We decided as a group the best thing to do was head back to shore. We were over an hour from the shore and Max seemed to get more and more distant. Minutes started to pass and then I saw Max standing at the edge of the boat. We all started to get really worried about him, but we thought, uh, He's probably just anxious, because he wasn't the only one that was freaked out by the song. Then Max jumped. I'm out of time, so go to part two. I have thalassophobia. Part two is the last thing I told you is Max jumped into the water. I saw it and I ran to the back of the ship. I dove into the water after him. Thankfully, I managed to grab a hold of his arm. It took everything I had to drag him back to the boat, and he fought against me the entire way back. He started screaming that he wanted to go with her, but none of us saw anyone else in the water. There was still no land in sight, and Max seemed to be going mad. Our adventurous summer night had quickly turned into a nightmare. We had to tie Max down to keep him from jumping again. As we got closer to the shore, the song started to fade away. Max stopped fighting us and eventually fell asleep. We called an ambulance for him as soon as we docked. Nobody died on that trip, but something in Max did. His lively spirit was replaced by a seemingly hollow shell. He was never the same again. From then on, I promised myself, I would never step foot on a boat again. Sometimes I still have dreams about it. And that's just one of the many reasons I went on a Tinder date with a serial killer. I'm gonna attempt to turn this into a makeup look while I tell you about it. I just moved out to LA when this happened. I didn't know anyone, so my roommate suggested that I download Tinder to meet people. That wasn't one of my brightest ideas. And I matched with this guy who seemed really, really nice. I never used Tinder before, so I didn't realize there was this whole thing where like you shouldn't have them come to your house. This guy's like, I want to meet, and I'm like, totally, come pick me up at my house. He arrives around the same time as my roommate's bed, and this is important. My roommate is bringing in the bed. He offers to build the bed for her. He builds her bed, and then he's like, do you want to go get some ice cream? We start walking to go get ice cream, and I see a pigeon. And I'm like, oh my gosh, have you read that book, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus? You know, like, date small talk. It was actually my favorite book as a kid. It's about this pigeon that you're not supposed to let drive the bus. And he's like, no, but I did stab a pigeon 27 times in the eye until it died with a toothpick. This is before we get to the ice cream place. Like we're on the way walking. At this point, I'm ready to turn around because why would you say that? That's not even the worst part. I stayed and got the ice cream and you're gonna have to go to part two. I went on a Tinder date with a serial killer part two. I'm gonna tell you about it while I take this off. Now, to be honest, I was in totally a hurry to get home because 
of what he said. You guys, this guy was so nice. Like besides that, every single thing he said was so nice. So we make the walk back to my house and I'm just praying to God that he doesn't murder me. And when we got back, I had to tell him, you know, it's not gonna work out. We walk up and that's what I'm thinking about this entire date. Like there is no thought in my mind that we're gonna have a second date. We go inside and I go, it was so good to meet you. Thanks for taking me out, bye. And to be honest, I was planning on ghosting this guy. After all, my roommate is Tori and we are got ghost. But the next day this man shows up at my house and he brings homemade chocolate chip cookies they look scary like if we eat them we might get drunk scary me and tori do not eat them and then he's texting me blowing up my phone and i'm not answering so he shows up at my house again me and tori are like do we let him in we did end up letting him in so like for part three i did a serial killer part three the next day he showed up at my house he said why did you ghost me why did you stop talking to me like what did i do wrong i told him the generic like this isn't gonna work out i just don't see us having a future together etc this man sits down on my stairs let's remember that i went on one date with this man this man starts bawling his eyes out and then he said that that's the exact same thing his ex-girlfriend said and me and tori are just standing there like what is going on this man was clearly not over his last relationship. He spent the next hour trauma dumping on us. And then for some reason, I thought it was a good idea to tell this man that the reason why I ghosted him, you probably shouldn't tell people that you murdered a pigeon. And guys, if you look at my history of exes, I'm apparently really good at ignoring red flags. But this was a red flag that I just couldn't ignore because it's one of the early signs of a serial killer. I don't know where this man is today, which is why I wouldn't be surprised if I found out. 